Amen. First of all, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank your pastor. He's uh, been a good friend to me last year or so, and uh, truly a blessing. Uh, even extended beyond as I came down here and, and was given this opportunity. It's uh, truly an honor, and I pray God that he would use it greatly. Talking about the temple of the Lord today, the temple of the Lord. Obviously, it's repeated three times in here. In the context here, we find Jeremiah the preacher uh, doing something that's very uncomfortable. And, and I've, I've been there, standing in the gates, standing in the gates and proclaiming a word to people that are, are not willing, not wanting to hear it. I, I remember several times in my life where I literally had, had stood between, between a, a, an entry, perhaps, of a building, uh, maybe in my younger Christian days, and, and uh, as my church, which wasn't a good church, but I wanted to be faithful there, was inviting the Masons to come and to sing and to, and to do their whole choir thing. And, and, and I, had, I, had this, uh, I had this in my ignorance, this little, little sign here that had different quotes from Freemasons. You know, Freemasonry is not Christianity. Some of the higher level guys saying things like, when, when, a, when, a, when a Freemason has mastered his art, the seething powers of Lucifer are in his hand. And, and as, as, as the event happened and the church was packing out, I, I refused to take part of it. And I literally stood in the gates and tried to compel some of my other brothers and sisters to not join in this. Not, this, this isn't right. This isn't, this isn't godly. And so I can, I can sympathize here with Jeremiah as he stands in the gates and is commanded by the Lord to do so. It's interesting, as he's standing there, verse 1 says, The word came unto Jeremiah. Down in verse 2 it says, This word he was to proclaim. And the first statements that he makes are, Hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. He cries out to the people. So the word came to him. This word he took in the first charge that he made was, People hear. Hear the word of God. To those that entered into worship, to those that you would think would be, would be doing the right thing before God, he cries out, hey, hear the word of the Lord. And he was giving this word to the same people. It says that the God of Israel is spoken to them. Thus saith the Lord, verse 3, of hosts. The God of Israel, he says, amend your ways and your doings and I will cause you to dwell in this place. The word comes. He brings the word. The proclamation is made. Hey, hear the word of the Lord coming from the God of Israel, coming from your God, coming from your Lord, people. He says, if you will, if you will, in verse 3, and this is always how God works with his people Israel. If you know anything about the old covenant, the fault was found with the people. God didn't do anything wrong. God kept his covenant as he had promised, and yet finding fault with them, a new one needed to come in. He said, if thou wilt, I will. If thou wilt, I will. If thou wilt, I will. It's always conditional. Yeah, you become a child of Israel. Yeah, you become his children. Here, Israel as a whole was made a type of the same. And believers, we enter into the family of God. We are sons of God, and that lasts forever. But he still has that same promise to you. If thou wilt, I will. If thou wilt, I will. God wants to work in our lives, but he wants us to take steps for him in the right direction before he'll do so. Amen. He has a message for us. He has a word for us. Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah that stand in the gates to worship the Lord. And we have the same call today. Hear ye the word of the Lord. You stand in the gates. You're entering into this place even today to worship the God of heaven, the God of Israel. Hear his word, people. Amen. Verse 4 says, Trust not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. These are vain words. God clearly outlines it. He says, This is vanity. Well, why was that? Well, because the people were coming, and I believe they were trusting in something that was in spite of God. Something other than God as they walked in and made this great proclamation. We saw it even when his disciples walked Jesus through the temple and said, look at these stones. And Jesus made the statement, these stones will be thrown down. There's an end to all of these things. Trust not in vain words, saying the temple of the Lord are these, but rather trust in the words that are to follow. Jeremiah continues in verse 5. For if ye truly amend your ways and your doings, if ye truly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if ye oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your hurt, then will I cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave your fathers forever and ever. Here the condition was made, hey, if you will do what I say, if you will truly amend your ways, I will give you this land. You will have it forever and ever. You will not be hurt. You will not be harmed. You will not suffer as you are right now. If you do these things, if you trust in this word, what Lord? 
the word of the Lord that Jeremiah is proclaiming, the word of the Lord that's contained in our scriptures, then will I, God always promises, then will I cause you to dwell, cause you to live in that land that I gave your fathers, and you will do it forever and forever and forever. What a great promise from a wonderful God. Amen. The words of vanity are, the temple of the Lord are these. The words of verity are contained in the New Testaments in 1 Corinthians 3.16. Well, know ye not that ye are the temple of God Amen. and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? See, their problem was idolatry. And we found that resonated throughout Israel. Even when Christ arrived on the scene, they were very idolatrous. They were very sucked in by things. That's why they're, they're proclaiming the temple of the Lord are these. This, this, these, these things are the temple of God. Their problem was idolatry and they were serving the temple rather than serving the Savior. They, they were showing reverence. They were showing their love. They were showing their worship to a bunch of stones, rather than God that formed the dust of the earth. Our responsibility and the desire that God always had with these people was that they would serve Him and that they would do it His way. It's simple. It's a simple call, right? He says, hey, serve me above all things. Obey me above all things and do it my way. Keep my rules. Keep my judgments. Keep my order of things. And they were saying, look at this wonderful temple. Look at this temple as they enter into the gates. They're in awe at the building rather than the builder. Amen. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Your body is the temple, and it was bought with a price. God purchased your body with a particular desire. When we go and we buy things, we have an intent for them. We don't often just waste our expenditures, waste our means to just get something that's useless. And God is far above. He, he's a wise investor. And so when God bought your body, He bought it for a price, and He bought it for a purpose. I love this, this, little, this little jingle, this little uh, thing that I, I've learned in order to memorize 1 Corinthians 3.16 in, in a Baptist church I attended before. It It goes, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. 1 Corinthians 3.16. That's a great way to memorize things. You continue on in that verse, though. What does verse 17 say? It says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Amen. And, he's, and he's purpose, and he's pointing and saying that. You're the temple of God. You've got a purpose. He's got a plan for you. And if you're going to defile it, get ready, for God is on your heels to destroy you. Because the temple is holy. Ye are to be holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy, he said. And yet these in verse 8, they said, it says in verse 8, Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. There is no profitability in the statement. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. God wants you to worship him. Not these, not this, not that. He wants you to worship him. And so why are they walking into the temple with the mindset that the building is what's important? They need to walk into the temple with the mindset that it's God that's important above all things. Walk in with God as, your, as your, you know, the forefront of your mind, the desire of your heart. Go to the temple to meet with the Lord, not to worship the buildings, the seats, the chairs, the, uh, the, the, the beautiful uh, decorations, the ornaments, the, the, the different fabrics, all the things that are going on in the temple. Yeah, they are good. Yeah, they are great. But the purpose was that the temple is you. God wants you. He wants you to be there engaged with him. Romans chapter 12 says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Your reasonable service to Lord. Yeah, there's a lot of things going on in the church when you meet together, when you, when you, when you join together, when you, you fellowship one with another. There's a lot of things going on, but your most important service to God is presenting yourself first and foremost. Present your body Holy, acceptable, that's your reasonable service. But it's funny because as you read the Old Testament, which is written for our samples, so often as the Jew do, so do you. 
Isn't it true? As the Jew acts and behaves, and as their attitudes come out, and as they congregate together, and they murmur, and they complain, they fight, and they bicker, and they, they rebel, as the Jew do, so do you. Isn't that amazing? God wrote an example, and when you open it up, you're like, wow, that's me, wow, that's me, wow, that's me. And that's to correct you, that's to admonish you, that's to bring you back into his fold. God says to the Jews here that these things, that this service, that this works that you do, you do it all in vain because you're doing it for the wrong reasons. You're doing it to embellish and to worship a stinking building. It's God that you need to worship. Verse 9 says, Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations? It seems like the people had this mindset that because, because they followed the order, because they came to the temple, because they followed all of the sacrifices and the rituals and the outward shows, it seems that they thought that that would be enough to deliver them from the abominations that they were doing the rest of the week. It seemed like they showed up and said, oh, the temple, the temple, the temple are these. And they did their little holy sanctimonious walk through it and did all of their rituals and rigmarole that was ordered for the day. And then they walked away. And what they do? Adultery, swearing falsely, burning incense in a bell, serving other gods was what made up the rest of their week. Garbage. What are they doing? But like I said, as they do, so often we do too. The temple of the Lord for us these days, when we come to the house of God, when we, when we come to a religious meeting and we say, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. It's, it's not stone that we worship. It's, it's, not, it's not the statues that we worship. It's not, it's not the, uh, the artifacts that we worship. No, we're better than that, right? But what we do is we take that order of service and we apply the same attitude to it. We say, oh, well, well because I'm going to church in the first place, Oh, because I put my time in soul winning. Oh, because I give my tithe. Oh, because I read my Bible. Because I get together and I fellowship and I talk about the word of God. I'm delivered to do these things the rest of the week. Isn't that how we act? These things are all good things. And and the stuff that was instituted in the temple was all good things. But do you see how their mind was confused about what the focus was? They come in and they say, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord are these. And we come in and we say, well, I go to church. I pay my tithes. I soul win. And we're saying the same thing. The temple of the Lord is all these things. All these things that I do. All these things that I follow after. All these things that I love. All these things, while good in nature, done with the wrong heart. They just make you into a religious hypocrite. And that's the problem that I find so often in churches these days. We go and we take our religious pill, right? We take that pharmaceutical pill. We, we give ourselves that pharmaceutical shot. We get the needle, right? We don't, we, don't, we don't authorize vaccination. We don't think they're good around here, but we'll come to church and we'll get the religious vaccination, right? That's going to tie me off for the rest of the week. That's going to give me my buzz. That's going to give me my kick. That's going to help me to be soothed for the rest of the week. Let my conscience be be good because I went to church. Okay, I went soul winning. I did all these things. The temple of the Lord are these. No, ye are the temple of God. And those works contribute to you being holy because you're the temple and you're supposed to be holy, but they're not the focus. The focus is Christ and obedience unto him because that's what God is promoting here. God notices when you're being honest. God notices when you when you when you are when you are desiring Him. When your motives are right. When your heart is right with Him. He he he'll look at the outward, and we'll all look at the outward and think, brother so and so, pastor, brother so and so, sister. They got it together. Look at them. They're they're dressed right. They're in church on time. They're going soul and they're doing all the right things. They got it together. But God knows. God knows the truth. Verse 11 says, Is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. Too often we act like fools, and then we just think we're delivered to do so because we've done our religious duty. Hey, hey, our religious duty is to present your body. That's the reasonable service, a living sacrifice. If you're alive and you're quickened and you're breathing air today, then that means it's a 24-7 sacrifice given unto God. Present yourself, not your works, not your doings, not your, not your tithe, not your money. Self. Give yourself wholly unto him. And God notices when we do that even still. 
We go to the doors, right? We knock on the doors, and we often will try to convince somebody and encourage them to the Lord by saying, you know, God's chastisement will be upon you. You believe the gospel today, that's wonderful, but God's going to move in your life with chastisement to bring you unto his purposes and plans for you. We do this all the time. It's a routine step in our soul winning procedures, right? We also will then take examples of the past and use them and apply them to, to signify people that have made the mistakes, like Jonah, like, like David, like Saul. And when they have made sins before God, he has corrected them. And we look at that and say, yeah, that's a good stern warning. But don't we, don't we often just read those stories and glaze over them and think, oh, that could never be me. That could never apply to me. I could never be the one that's just, just vainly going and worshiping and just kind of doing the religious thing. But really, my heart is far from God. But God notices these things. And in verse 12, it continues. But go ye now into my place, which is called Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people. We don't take these warnings for ourselves. And this is why God has to keep reminding us of these things. Hey, if you're going to serve me, you have to serve me with my whole heart. The problem is the same that you read in Romans chapter 3. There is no fear of God before their eyes. We'll take that and apply that to the lost person and say, hey, they're lost, so there's no fear of God for him. But how often do we take that and walk right into our Christian life with the same mentality? We just don't fear God. We don't consider him holy. We don't revere him. We don't lift him up as the high and lofty one. We don't consider that God would be angry with our sins. Why? Because I go to church. I read my Bible. I do all of these things. The temple of the Lord are these. So, so why would God be angry with me? Because God wants you. He wants all of you. He wants your whole heart. And God is gracious in all of this. Verse 13, it says, And now because ye have done all these works, saith the Lord, and I spake unto you, rising up early, speaking to you, but ye heard not, and that's the reality is that God continually is reaching out to us. He is continually sending the prophet. He's sending the preacher. He's sending the message. He's giving you the Bible. You can open it and you can be convinced for yourself that what you're doing is wrong and you can get it right. And that's exactly how God works in our lives. He understands we're frail and we're butt flesh and we're going to mess up. But you have to have the soft heart that when God says, thus saith the Lord, and you go, I'm guilty, you get it right. And you work on getting it right. You don't go back to the church house you don't go back to the temple and try to then appease god like some of these heathen have done before they bring their sacrifice they bring their service they bring their good works before a holy god and think that that's going to appease him no god wants a contrite heart that's the sacrifice of god a contrite and broken spirit that comes before him and says i've sinned against you and i want to get it right God is so gracious to reach out to us again and again and again. And I'm hard-headed. He has to tell me one, two, three, four times. I wish it weren't so. But God constantly reminds me where I'm failing in my life. And I need to be soft to those examples that he gives to me. And soft to those promptings and soft to those rebukes in order that they would enter in and I could change these things. And we should all do the same. Verse 13 says, of the people of Israel. How often are we this so? God rises up early and speaks, but ye heard not. I called unto you, the Lord says, but ye answered not. Verse 14 says, therefore will I do to this house which is called by my name, wherein ye trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. As I have done to Jonah, as I have done to David, and go on and on and on. You can read through the Old Testament and find examples of this. Verse 15 says, I will cast you out of my sight as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. God promises, hey, he's going to break down your idols. He's going to cast you out if you don't get this right. If you don't understand the difference between the temple of the Lord are these and the Lord is he. When God judges, when God casts out, it's, it's amazing to find in verse 16, he says, Therefore, pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. Now, we all, we all believe in the idea of the reprobate mind, but look, at we're, we're finding the, the, that God has a last call. God has a deadline even for his own people. 
How awful would it be to be a, a, a believer, to be seemingly doing the right things, to be seemingly going to church and praying and following after God, and you think you're doing all the right things, but what you're actually doing is just saying, hey, the temple is these. The temple is all of this that I'm doing. And you're not presenting yourself as a living sacrifice, and you find yourself in that stubborn cycle to the point where it all comes to conclude that you are thrown out, you are cast out, God corrects you, and then he looks to your brethren and says, don't even pray for him. Don't even lift him up in prayer. I'm not going to hear. And this is how God is dealing with his people. It's gotten so bad with their idolatry. It's gotten so bad with their vain worship and their trusting in vain words that he looks to those that are following him and says, stop praying for them. It will do no good. Even in my short time in ministry, I've, been, I've, I've pleaded with, I've pleaded for, I've instructed those that oppose themselves. People that are, I can see are going in the wrong direction. And I'm not some big shot, but when you're on the outside looking in, even the Bible says that even the least esteemed one is able to judge such matters. Isn't it amazing how when you're outside of a situation and you look on your brother, he may be a, a bigger Christian than you, he may be a stronger Christian than you, but you can see things that he can't. You can see a spiritual blind spot. And you say, brother, you got to stop. you got to get this right. you got to stop going down this path. And I've seen it where, where men are desiring some sort of cookie cutter religion they want something that looks exactly like pastor so-and-so or or evangelist such and such and they want this exact kind of picture perfect image that they have in their mind to become their reality and what they're missing when they make the cookie cutter religious idea and they want to bring it to their life they're missing the lord they're saying the temple of the lord are these we can't worship right until we worship exactly this way we can't live right until we do it exactly by this method exactly by this plan and i've seen it time and time again where there comes a point with people that have that mindset where it's just all about the religious fix, where eventually it becomes too late for them. And they cast themselves out, they get cast out, they get removed from what would be the inner cycle, the inner church, the, the body of Christ. The temple of the Lord are these. How often do we say, oh, it's my work, it's my way, it's, it's my ritual, it's me, 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 it's my, my, my. I'm delivered to do all of these things throughout the week as long as I do what is right during this three hours time on Sunday. No, this is not the case. This is not true. You are not delivered to one of these. Christians today got to put down your idols. You got to lay aside your abominations. You got to quit inventing and trusting in vain words that shall not profit. You got to heed the scriptures. God's coming to you, rising up early and sending the prophet to say, hey, get it right. Obey my voice. And too often, even among Christians, they hear not, they answer not, they won't want anything to do with the word of God because they already have their minds made up about how things ought to be. And so God judges, and justly so, because rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and there's nothing more than rebellion when people get this mentality and this attitude. These are worthy of judgment, and we see that so many times even in our circles. How, how many know of what, what I like to call the, the internet fundamental Baptist? The guy that sits at home eating chips off his chest, watching sermons, watching other churches, never darkens the door of a church. Right. But when he finally does, what does he come with? All the preconceived notion of the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. And he's going to tell everybody that they're doing it wrong. He's going to go straight to the preacher on day one and say, hey, you got to do this right and that right. And you're not doing this right. And you're not doing that right. Because he has in his mind what he saw on the internet to be that perfect temple this is exactly what i need for worshiping and if it's not so he's going to be in and he's going to be out one way is god will just cast him out through the preacher through the the direct uh discipline of the church or he'll just fade away and wander off and go back into his own internet world he's rebuked and he's removed. And that's what verse 15 says. And I will cast you out of my sight as I have cast out your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. And I've seen that time and time again. Where those that come, those intermittent fundamental Baptists, show up at church. They want to tell me how I'm doing everything wrong. When they get removed, it, it's, it's just like they, they just give up at that point. That God's just not going to work with them. God's just not going to help them. Why? Because they need to get focused on God and not be so focused on the religual, religious rigmarole, the religious program, the religious idea, the pill that they want that will satisfy them. Verse 17 it says, Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven, to pour out drink offerings unto other gods 
that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, saith the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, mine anger and my fury shall be poured out upon this place, upon man and upon beast and upon the trees of the field and upon the fruit of the ground, and it shall burn and shall not be quenched. What I notice here is that there is a very fearful and terrifying promise from God to those that provoke God. They, they're provoking even their own faces, the Bible says, provoking him to anger, performing this ritual in front of them. These would include all of the abominations that they think they're delivered to do at the side. As long as they come to the true God's temple every week, then they think they're delivered. But look, this is one thing that is really important, especially for a group like this. Religious vanity here had become a family affair, didn't it? Weren't the children involved? Wasn't mama involved? Wasn't daddy involved? Weren't they, weren't they all getting together and working their little religious routine for a false god? We need to look at ourselves, moms and dads, and when our service starts becoming sloppy, when our devotion becomes dishonest, when, when our show, when the outward appearance of this is vain, it's fleshly, it's carnal, it's earthly, it's sensual, it's devilish, Children know, and children follow. And we got to be mindful of this, because this, this is a real problem. The, the best way that we can lead our children is by example and with a pure heart that desires after God. If they see mom and dad mess up, if they see mom and dad make mistakes and sin and do all those sorts of things, that, that's okay. But if, if their heart is always repentant and moving in the direction of God, that's what's important, and that's what kids are going to catch on to. They're going to see mom fall. They're going to see dad fall. But they're going to see the family unit pick each other up and then direct each other towards God. And that is what's most important. We can't get this attitude that it's some sort of religious routine that we just have to follow, and then we're pleasing God. No, we need to seek after pleasing God and let everything else follow after. Following Christ is not complicated. It's not some difficult, strange thing that we can't even grasp. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, it talks about the simplicity that is in Christ. The simplicity that is in Christ. And yes, in that context, it's talking about salvation. There is a simplicity in the salvation that Christ offers. But what I believe is that I don't believe in works salvation any more than I believe in works sanctification. If we're following after God, he is going to, because he is light, naturally expose the darkness that is on Josh Gander so that Josh can finally see it and correct it. Now, did I expose the darkness in me? No, going to the light did. Did I reveal to myself that I was, I was, I was prideful, that I was arrogant, that my heart was divided? No, the word of God did. All of that was given to me. I didn't do anything to earn the scriptures or to have the light of God shine upon me. I simply trusted him and obeyed him. Okay, the thing about sanctification, we tell people at the door this all the time. Salvation's the easy part and sanctification is, is hard. Living the Christian life is the challenge. And it's true, it is harder. It's more challenging. It takes more time to grow in the things of God. But I believe the same principles of salvation apply to our sanctification. Simply trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And this is exactly what God keeps telling his people Israel. Quit trying to do, do, work, work, be, be, and strive to satisfy some sort of temple routine and just obey my voice. It's simple. In Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 21, it says, Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, put your burnt offerings unto your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifice. He's saying, he's saying, hey, the first thing that I came to you with wasn't to talk about all your temple ordinances, wasn't to talk about all the works you had to do for me, wasn't to talk about how you were going to arrange your order of service. He says the first thing that he came to them was verse 23. But this thing commanded I them saying, obey my voice. And I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. Walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. 
Okay, understandably that all of the ritual that followed after was part and parcel to obeying his voice, but it started from that simple command to just obey me, just do as I have said. And it's confirmed here. It says God didn't come out and say, sacrifice, sacrifice, work, labor. He didn't come out and say, hey, the temple of the Lord are these, and this is what's most important. It's the temple. It's what's going on. This is what's more, most important. He didn't come out and just say, hey, you got to be a bit like Martha. You got to just be cumbered about with much busyness and work and work and work and work and labor. No, rather, God said, Obey my voice that it may be well with you. Be like Mary. Sit at Jesus' feet. Bask in him for a while. Learn from his scriptures. Obey his voice. Hear the word of God and allow that to be the motivating factor to everything that you do. Do you see how there's a different mentality here? Walking in the temple going, oh, the temple, the temple, the temple. Or walking into the temple and going, obey the voice of God. Obey the voice of God. Obey the voice of God. There's a difference in the mindset. One is just going to do vain shows in the flesh. The other is going to see how God might work in a life today and change it and help me. But again, I'm hard-headed. I'm, I'm prideful. I'm set in my own ways. I often walk after the old path of my flesh instead of following after the Spirit. And this is what often happens. Our old path isn't just, isn't just that old-time religion. Every one of us has this thing called the old man, and that's our old path. Our old path is, is dirty, it's wrong, it's selfish, it's unrighteous, and that is always going to be there. We can't follow after our own ideas. We can't follow after our own motives. We can't work to our own glory. That's what we've been taught all of our lives. So it seems contrary, but that's the one thing that we need to put aside, push away. In Ephesians chapter 4, you can go there, Ephesians chapter 4. We were taught by the world to have a certain mindset. And the mindset is this. Me, me, my, my. Everything revolves around me and satisfying me. And do what you can to glorify self. And, and, and there's all these slogans that are just, 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 just do it, right? They're just pumping across the airwaves, just trying to encourage you to selfishness. But God says that's got to go. Ephesians chapter 4, even though we were taught by those that we are following after, we take those same patterns into our Christian life. If you, were, if you were a bitter person before you got saved, and I tell people this door, at the door all the time, I say, man, when I was saved, I had problems, I, I had issues, I mean, I, 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 was, I was a drinker, I was all this, I'm like, I just had so many problems. And then I say, oh, but when I got saved, I mean, the next day I woke up and I had problems, I had issues, I had, <laughs> I, say, I say, getting saved isn't going to change how you are right now. I mean, some people, yeah, they get like, you know, gloriously saved, and there's just this one thing that just completely changed in your, their lives. Sure, I glorify God for that, amazing. But, but the reality is, is that most of us wake up the same way we do. It's just that our problems and our issues that we face here in life, they're so minor because I'm going to heaven, right? It just kind of puts things into the proper perspective. But the reality is, is those patterns, the way that you live, it's going to follow you. I mean, some of these things were so ingrained, especially if you've been saved later in your life. You're going to act like you acted. You're going to run your mouth like you run your mouth. You're going to get angry like you got angry. These things are always going to be with you unless you're renewed. And we need to be renewed because this is what Christ taught. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 20. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him, have been taught by him, as the truth is in Christ, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is a corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which is after God created in righteousness and true holiness." See, the thing is, is that we all have that flesh, but every day we can make that choice. Actually, every moment you can make that choice to put off, put away. Isn't that what God did when he walked into that temple? He put away those that had that, that temple of the Lord idea. He put them out. In the same way, you can take your flesh, you can take your old man, and every day just put him away. A decision comes to me. I'm at a crossroads. I got to go this way or I got to go that way. Glorify flesh and go and watch football or go to church and glorify God. And I put away the old. I put away the old. And I, and I constantly just desire to put on 
Christ. Be renewed in the spirit of my mind. Be changed in my mind. Allow the washing of the water of the word to flow over my mind. So suddenly and gradually and as time passes, I get more and more and more and more like him. Yeah, you can still backslide from these things, but the thing that we need to understand is that righteousness, as it says in verse 24, and true holiness is created by God. We simply just put it on. God created and fashioned righteousness and true holiness. That is the new man. That was birthed inside you. We simply put it on. And I'll ask that question that's stated. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. And you see how when we have the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. And those people that are internet fundamental Baptists and they do all the soul winning and they do all the works and they do all this and they're puffed. That gives you this puffed up mentality, that boasting that, that God wants nothing to do with. But if somebody comes and humbly allows for God to renew their mind, God to help them put off the former conversation, put on the new conversation, there is no boasting. It's completely and 100% excluded. And this is why and this is how God wants to work in our lives. Luke chapter 17 and verse 10 says, So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded, you say, Look at me, I'm great. I've done all these great works. I am the best soul owner in church. I'm just doing all the things for a pastor. I'm just cleaning up all the lawn. I'm just doing all... No, he, he doesn't say that. When you've done the things which are commanded, you say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. And you see how that's the right mentality? God is, is one that needs to be served. And we are in service to him. And as a result, we're, we're pretty much unprofitable because I wouldn't have known sin except the law said, thou shalt not. And so God gives me the law. It enters in. I yield myself to it. I'm renewed. I put off the former way and decide to follow God's way. And it's him that had told me to do it. It's him that empowers me to do it. And it's him that gives me the strength to follow through with any kind of area of sanctification i'm just an unprofitable servant all i've done is what god asked me to do as servants of christ think about it he gives life he gave the birth right he gives breath he gives you the strength to go on now that you're alive he gives you also that new mind he gives you the clothes to put on, right? The whole armor of God. It's simply a gift that he puts on your back. He gives you every tool that you could possibly need to perform the work that he requires for you to do. He's commanded, I'm just an unprofitable servant because all I've done is what he asked me to do. Full enablement given from God. All we have to do is trust and obey him. So I would say this, in the area of religion, there's nothing wrong with religion. Though I'm saying, hey, this temple of the Lord mentality, yeah, that's wrong. But religion is this. It's not the temple of the Lord. It's not the temple of the Lord. It's not those vain words that the whole of what we believe religion is hinged upon. Rather, it is pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Amen. Briefly comprehended, what is that? Love thy neighbor, love God. Right? That's pure religion in its simplest form. we got to love and bless and encourage others, the fatherless and widows, those that are in the most need of help. We need to lift up. We need to strengthen. We need to encourage. And we need to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, how do we love God? If ye love me, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. Keep yourself unspotted from the world. That's the purest form of religion. Notice what's missing here. The order, the, the sacrifices, the, the, uh, you know, the Bible study, the, the, the tithes, the, all the things that we lift up as some sort of uh, religious rite, some sort of, now oh, I've made it because I'm doing the five things that we have deemed as Baptists to be most important in the Christian life. But I find too often we miss out on the weightier matters we miss out on simply loving and serving god when we make our life our religious life our christian life into just a checklist that we follow again romans chapter 12 verse 1 says i beseech you brethren by the mercies of god that she present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God. It says, And be not transformed, or be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect 
will of God. And that's the thing, is we need to be transformed in order to show out what His will is. We need to be transformed in order to be in way to be good and acceptable in His sight. We need to be transformed to prove to others who the Lord that bought us, who the Lord that saved us even is. Be transformed. Be a renewed vessel presented to God. And that's just what's reasonable for your life today. We back in Jeremiah 7.23. It says, But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people, and walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. In verse 24, it continues, it said, But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ears, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart, and went backwards and not forwards. So what I see here is the direction that they're going is key. You notice how God doesn't just get on you as soon as you, you know, backslide. You don't go soul winning because you're feeling kind of lazy. You don't read your Bible because you're just kind of tired. He doesn't just get on you, okay? But God's desire is that you would obey his voice, hear what he wants for you to do, and go forward, okay? You got to go forward. Not backwards, but go forward. And this is the thing that is key in the Christian life. We are all going to slide back. We are all going to stumble. We are all going to mess up. But where is our direction taking us? It's got to be forward in the things of God. It's got to be in the direction of him. It's got to be focused on keeping what God wants as my primary and putting other things aside. Yeah, I'm going to mess up. I'm going to stumble. But if I'm going in the right direction, it's what God desires most for us. Go forward. Go Amen. forward. Go forward. Don't go back. Remember Lot's wife? Verse 27, Therefore thou shalt speak all these words unto them, but they will not hearken unto thee. Thou shalt also call them, but they will not answer thee. Why? Because they didn't answer God, so why would he expect that his preacher would get through to them? But thou shalt say unto them, This is a nation that obeyeth not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receiveth correction. Truth is perished and is cut off out from their mouth. And today I fear that we're in a state like that. We're in this way that if you do go to church, it's just some ritual. It's just some, it's just some routine. It's just, it's just some vain show. You're just trying to get your fix and then move on to the rest of the week. You think you're delivered to do whatever you want to do Monday through Wednesday and Saturday as long as you show up on Sunday. Put in your time. Do your duty. Do your work. We're in a day that is just full of religious phonies, hypocrites, that wouldn't know the voice of God they wouldn't know the voice of God if it was that audible voice telling them next steps, telling them what to do, telling them where to go. The Bible says of this group that truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. They're not even able to speak the word because the time has come. They've crossed the line. And even as believers, God's not going to work with them. He tells, he tells their friends, don't even pray for these people. They messed it up so bad. And the end isn't good, okay? This isn't, this isn't a happy end to the message. My, my main focus is that, hey, obey God. Obey God. Obey the voice of God. And you can find that in verse 23 there. Because that's God's main thrust in this whole chapter. He says, this thing I commanded them. And it's not about the temple. It's not about the ritual. It's not about the routine. It's about obeying my voice. That needs to be your primary focus. But unfortunately, Jeremiah had to bring some messages sometime that were, didn't end positive, did they? In verse 34, it says, Then will I cause to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. And those are the joys that come when you obey him. Didn't God promise, say, If you will, I will. If you will, I will. You will dwell in this land forever. Just do what I say. Obey my voice. Just, oh, just follow me. Just love me. And yet they didn't. And therefore, that voice of mirth, that voice of gladness, that voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the celebratory rejoicing isn't there because they're not walking in the statutes. They're not seeking after the Savior, but rather they're just seeking after the temple, the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord are these. It says at the end, the land shall be desolate. And in the Old Testament, quite often the land that the Bible is referring to, is, is, is typified as the, the Christian living, the, the victorious Christian life. The land of promise 
is like when a Christian gets saved, steps across Jordan through the waters of baptism, and now they're in the decision making. They're going to obey God or they're not going to obey God. And they'll be able to keep the land. They'll be able to keep victorious Christian life if they just obey God and follow after God. They'll have great victories of faith and, and they'll do great exploits because this is, what, this is what God wants for them. And he promised. He said, if you will, I will. If you will, I will. But here it says, the land is desolate. And if you follow after this, oh, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these mentality, and you're, and you're not obeying God, you're just doing the routine, then your land, your victorious Christian living, your promises, your, your growth, your strength, your increase, and your dwelling in the land will be all just made desolate. There will be nothing. There will be ruin to those that don't follow after him. We need renewal today, don't we? we? We need to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. We need to put off concerning the former conversation. We need to start walking after the new man and, and giving power and strength unto the new man by obeying God, putting that thing on every other day, getting that armor on our backs. It's the only way we're going to be renewed, and the only way that we can get that renewal is through the Bible. We can go there every single day and we can get a little Amen. bit of renewal. I open up this book all the time, every morning, and I go, Ooh, I'm not doing that. Eee, oh, I'm not doing that. Oh, that hurts. That's things. God got me there. But hey, that's just the reality. I mean, I'm not going to be perfect until I'm glorified. I'm not going to be perfect until I'm sitting and thrown in heaven. But if I can, with a sincere heart, open the Bible and say, Thou shalt not. I did that yesterday. God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Help me. Strengthen me. Wash my mind. Promote that new man. Get rid of that old guy. Put him to death. I render him dead. Then I can grow and I can be strengthened. I can take steps towards God and away from that mentality of just the temple of the Lord are these. All of my works, all of my doings, because my focus is always going to be on serving Christ. And when I'm focusing on serving Christ, then the religious side of things naturally follows. My first heart and my first step should be simply to follow after him, simply trust and obey him. And just like he asks, obey my word, obey my word. Word, obey my word and that's the next steps that every believer needs to make is to just open it up and say yeah I've done wrong and obey his word trust him take steps forward obey his voice that's what God wants from you in this message and that's the pathway of victorious Christian living Amen. thank you father for this day Lord and I, I pray God that this message uh, helps some of those that were here Lord it truly helped me and, and I thank you for for uh, giving it to me and uh, strengthening me through it and I'm just so thankful for this opportunity. I love you, Lord, and, and thank you for every good and perfect gift you've given. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.